thanks for the um, invitation, I suppose, to speak at this conference. It's really good to speak to a room of academics and practitioners, and hopefully we can um, some, learn something today um, from all the presentations we see. Um, right, so what I've done in my preparation, I've tried to squeeze a 60-minute presentation into 15 minutes. So um, I reckon the other guys would have too. So let's see how we go. But my real aim, I've got two real aims, is to give you the theoretical basis of monitoring training and where um, athlete tracking fits into that. Uh, and then if I get time and Chris doesn't kick me off stage, I'll uh, talk about um, how it's applied in a real world setting. So they're the, the aims of the next sort of 14 minutes and 37 seconds. And we'll have a discussion later. So first of all, let's get into this, and I know we all know this, but I thought let's revise the theoretical basis of, of training periodization, training monitoring, um, and then why do we set up systems that prepare athletes um, to perform, but also to reduce their risk of injury. Uh, we all know when we do a training bout, our, immediately our capacity is reduced, and then we slowly readapt and supercompensate. That adaptation occurs, and in theory, in the textbooks, we see this curve all the time. And we know that if we get the optimum time between our training bouts, that we will get the training effect and we'll get improvements in our physical capacities, in theory. And that looks nice, and it's, but in, in reality, in the field, it's not so easy to see these nice performance curves that we see um, in the textbooks. This is based on the uh, dose-response effect of, say we have a training bout, down the bottom this black box shows us a training bout. Um, and we get a fatigue effect to a training bout and also a fitness effect. So we all know if we do an acute training bout, we feel tired, fatigued, sore immediately. We don't necessarily feel the improvement or the changes in fitness that we gain from that single bout. However, if we um, model performance from that, it should look something like we saw on the previous slide. And that's described as um, the fitness fatigue model or the fitness fatigue equation. And this is basically the equation that we use for developing athlete monitoring systems. Now that's for one training bout. Let's have a look at uh, a series of training bouts or a training program. Again, clearly theoretical, but what we've got is a, an intensified or dense training period followed by a less dense training period. We get the fatigue and fitness responses. Again, the fatigue increases quickly but dissipates quickly when less training is there. Similarly, uh, fitness gains slowly but dissipates slowly. And if we apply the fitness fatigue model, we'll get something like you'd see there, like a super compensation response to a training. Again, you can mathematically model this, but whether in fact it is clear in the field, and particularly in team sports, it's quite difficult to um, decipher. So we can describe our performance or understand our performance at any time as our current fitness minus our present fatigue state. Now, fitness and fatigue can present in a number of ways, um, as shown there, can be neuromuscular, physiological, or psychological, and it's a resp response of the imbalance between training load and recovery. And they're the things that we can control. We can control when we train and how much we train for, and we also control our recovery, what we do and when we do it. Now, performance for these models are really related to pure physical performance. But in the sports that m many of us work in, the team sports, we know that team sports performance is much more complicated than that. Factors such as luck, uh, skill, tactics, cohesion, ability, coaching, all play into those whether we win or lose. It's not simply physical performance. In fact, there's many studies showing that physical performance in a game may not be an indicator of success in, in team sport. So, um, but we'll talk about that. That's another topic of conversation altogether. So, um, so training load clearly is the bigger, bigger stimulus of this and the most important factor that we control. And if we control anything in a program, we should control our training load. And here's a slide that basically shows the relationship between low and high training load or training load and physical performance, where we seem to get a hormesis effect. Not enough is not good and too much is not good. Similarly, fitness, there tends to be a, an adaptive response to greater training load, the greatest fitness responses. And you'd agree for performance, physical performance and fitness are important characteristics. And there's also the risk of injury and illness. And it's a little bit like Goldilocks. Not enough is not good, too much is not good, and somewhere in the middle is about right. So there's, there's, you want to avoid the low end, um, and there's, there's big fat zone in the middle, which we try to say it's complicated, but it's not so complicated. There's a nice fat zone of what our athletes can tolerate um, and perform quite well at. But there's also a zone at the end that we want to avoid. But clearly, most of our coaches that we work with want to be at this end. They want to push to the limits. That's a part of performance, high performance. So we need to be our way to monitor 
our risks and our profile in this zone. So that's what training the relationship with training load. You probably know, I've seen this slide too as well previously, or if you haven't read the paper down the bottom, you should. It's an excellent slide um, from Franco and Palazzeri that basically explains training load as different constructs. Now, training load, not, not all training load is the same. There's the external training load, or the load that we did, and there's also how we responded to that load, and that's the internal training load. Let's take the group of us, it looked like a fit bunch of people in the room. If we all go for the sa exactly the same training bout right now, um, depending on our say, fitness characteristics, our jet lag characteristics, um, and our training status, we might all respond a little bit differently. Um, so, and that's the same for athletes. Depending on our periodization and our individual characteristics to the same session, we will respond differently. And that's the internal training load, the response. And that's reflected um, in our fitness and our fatigue state. So we can describe our external training load, and this is where microtechnology, yes, a catapult device in the back, Chris, um, uh, is how training was implemented, and the internal training load is how did they respond to that training. And contextualising those factors together is quite important for uh, understanding and controlling training at the individual level. So, a quick summary, three main points, is that we should plan and deliver training dose according to the external training load. But we should monitor the athlete response to that load from the internal responses. And these are only useful, though, for monitoring athletes if we contextualise that with other data. And I'll, I'll briefly talk about the other data soon. So that's training theory, monitoring 101 in uh, 6 minutes and 27 seconds. Um, now, let's see how we take this theory and apply that in the, in the real world with real athletes. So um, I've taken um, an example and, and, and suppose the model that we use, and I'll provide some examples of how we do this. And what actively actually happens in the field is coaches write a training plan. We as sports scientists measure the dose of what they apply, and that's where our microtechnology comes into it and other devices. So the dose, the external load, and then we measure the response to that load. Now that response can be measured like an internal load measure such as RPE or heart rate, or also for fitness and fatigue measures. And these are fundamental it's a part of the process, and this part of the process should be measured if you want to have good control of your training dose and understanding your training system. And if we understand the iteration of fitness and fatigue, that can estimate our performance status at any time. Because really in team sport, it's really difficult to measure what is performance. So we're guessing based on these measures and the control of this process. And we do this on a daily basis, and it's like Groundhog Day. If you've seen Groundhog Day in the movie, we start again the next day doing exactly the same thing. So let's go and have a look at how we might measure or control the training load dose. So what we do in the field is our role is to provide a guideline for our coaches for the intended load for that week. And the load that we provide, the guidelines that we provide, is quite a, a broad range of load. And we try to give the upper limits so our coach knows how much he can actually provide to our players. And we account for that, the chronic loading, so how much they've done over a longer period, but also we account for what they've done in a recent period, the acute spikes. So we give them a guide. Then the coach populates the guide roughly with you know, the, the volume and speeds that we, we estimate are appropriate. Um, and he chooses the drills based on his tactical requirements that meet that load. We then, he can check if that meets his technical or tactical requirements. And we can also then assess at the start of the week if he plans it out, we can assess for appropriate variation, we can look for spikes, spikes in loadings during the week, and we can also look for fundamental prioritisation issues that might occur. And then on a daily basis, so we set that plan at the start of the week, but then on the daily basis we'll individually modify players' loads or training based on expert feedback and some of the screening that we do and we'll adjust whether additional conditioning or work is required, training is required, and we might need to modify the drills where they may be at risk at in specific drills, for example, for a pre-existing injury that might be um, um, uh, lingering on an individual player. And then at the end of this week, actually compare, did we implement training compared to how we expected to? So that's simply the process that we go through on a weekly basis. And then we start again the next week. Um, so the take home message is I think athlete tracking technologies have allowed us to do a lot more precise job than we could do 15 years ago. We can measure a lot more things. But it's also created what I call a data tsunami. Um, we, just because we have all the data, we don't have to use it all. 
if you actually look at, whilst it looked like a lot of things, we measure four or five things in the whole program. It's not a lot. But what we do do is we do it regularly, we do it properly, and we analyse it thoroughly. So I think we also have a, 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 um, a responsibility to, for parsimony, to not to measure things that we don't need to measure or analyse things, because that's inefficiency. So select a tool that monitor and suit your environment. This model not, may not work for you, but I think the theoretical basis should, re should remain. One approach doesn't fit all. I recommend you use the simple tools and good science, collect the data properly, analyse it thoroughly, and the best tools still remain coaching and talking to people. Other than that, go with wellness measures, session RPE, and external training load. I think with that, you've got a good basis of a fundamental monitoring system. There you go. A couple of minutes over. Chris.